God's grace and God's goodness. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3. We looked at this same passage of Scripture last week, and we're going to look at it again from a different perspective. And I trust that the Lord will work in our hearts. John chapter 3, verse 22. It's amazing to me how the Word of God always has something new for us. And you can read... I was just talking about how the, the, the lyrics to Amazing Grace are, are a blessing to me every time I consider them. But it's the same truths. But when you look in the Word of God, you find different things that just pop out, of, pop out to you from the same verses. And only a supernatural book can do that. But John chapter 3, let's read the latter half of this chapter, starting in verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would speak to us. We need you to speak to our hearts. You don't speak to us with an audible voice. You don't dazzle us with visible signs and wonders, but you speak to us with the supernatural word of God to open our eyes and our understanding to our need and our sin and your goodness and your power and your sufficiency in everything. And Lord, the reason you do this is because of your grace. You are not obligated to save us. We deserve judgment. And as a just judge, you are obligated to judge our sin. But you also extend grace to us and give us an option to escape judgment and receive salvation. And I pray that you would work in hearts to that end this morning. But I pray that you'd work in the hearts of the saved as well. There are truths here for us the saved, the children of God, and I pray that you would speak to us at the same time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you look very hard at all, you will very quickly find that there are many life coaches out there that will give you kind, all kinds of advice on how to have a successful life. Maybe you've followed some of these. People have published books, people have blogs, people have all kinds of ways of providing their advice on how to live life. And, and some of it, if you've followed some of it, it may seem to work. Maybe in some cases, their advice does not seem to work for you. And it seems like with every, every life coach and that sort of thing, there are people that swear by it and say, this will turn your life around, and other people that say, it didn't do anything for me. It, it's worthless. It doesn't help. But in our text here, we find some principles John the Baptist is demonstrating. He demonstrates some wisdom on how to view life. And if we can take note and, and apply, we will find a lot of answers. 
he was occupied with serving the Lord, and the Jews brought a problem. I use that in quotes, because it wasn't a, a, a real, a big problem, but they thought it was a problem. They brought a problem to him, and many people have encountered this sort of problem themselves. In, in a broad sense, in a general sense, you may have had a similar problem, and maybe you didn't handle it properly. But John the Baptist did handle it properly, and we can learn from it. And the title of the message is, How to Handle Problems. And I want us to learn from what John had to say and what he did so that we can also handle problems properly. In verse 22, we find that Jesus was in Judea and he was baptizing. In verse 23, it says John was baptizing in a place near to Salim because there was much water there. And I dealt with this a little bit last week. There's, there's a lot of misunderstanding in our world about baptism. And I just want to briefly mention this. Baptism does not make anyone a child of God. Baptism does not take anyone to heaven. If you have been baptized, you're not going to heaven simply because you got wet. But many people believe that. They believe that if you get sprinkled, you've been baptized. John was baptizing in a place where there was much water. Sprinkling is not baptism. Immersion is biblical baptism because it pictures burial. You bury a body in the earth. You, you completely cover them with the earth. You do not sprinkle a little bit of dirt on them and call them buried. You don't, you don't pour dirt on them and call them buried. You, you bury them in the ground. And baptism is immersion under the water, but it doesn't save anyone. Baptism is for people who have already been saved. And John preached this message. He was baptizing people because they had been saved. And the next step for them was to be baptized. But there were Jews that brought a problem to John, and they thought it was a problem. And they said, you know, you're here baptizing. Many people are coming to, to, to hear you and, and to be saved and then to be baptized. But, but we've got a problem for you. You know, this man Jesus that you bore witness of, he's in this other place, and all men are coming to him. It says that they also had a question about purifying, and it was, it was kind of a technical question. It was a controversy that they were raising up, and people do that all the time today. They bring up a technical question for debate and controversy, and it, it confuses and distracts people. And so John was kind of dealing with these two problems, the first being this, this question about purifying, and, and why do you do it differently? What do you think about this? Well, I think this, and, and we can argue about it, and John wasn't going to get distracted. Distracted. But this also, this also this problem about Jesus being somewhere else, he's, he's doing the same thing you are. He's competition for you, and all people are going to him. What are you going to do about this? I mean, if you're the prophet of God, and you're doing this, why is he trying to steal your thunder, so to speak? This problem, and John dealt with it properly. The first thing that we need to do, follow John's example in how to handle problems, the first thing we need to do the first thing, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you, and I'll say you and your. The first thing to do is put yourself in your place. Put yourself in your place. We tend to fall into the trap of self-exaltation. And we lift ourselves up, and we take ourselves out of our proper place and lift ourselves higher than we ought to be. When, there's, when this problem came to John, they said in verse 26, Rabbi, he's over here baptizing. All men come to him. You have competition. They're all going to him. What are you going to do about it? How did John respond? Well, he answered very curiously in some ways, but we look deeper and, and we think about what he said, and he put himself in his place. Verse 27 John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You're coming to me with this problem as though I should be offended that somebody else is doing this? Anything that you see me having was given to me from heaven. Anything good that I have is not my own. It doesn't belong to me. It's not because I'm talented or I'm skilled or I'm powerful. It was just given to me from heaven. So why should I feel threatened? Anything good I have came from God. It was given to me. I don't have anything to boast about. Ye yourselves, verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I was sent before him. You know that that's what I've said. Why, is that, why should this be a problem for me? He's the Christ, and I bore witness of him, so why should I feel threatened by what he's doing? 
Self-exaltation. I'm gonna, let's look at some things about self-exaltation. Again, raising ourselves up higher than we ought to be. First thing about it is that it's dishonest. Self-exaltation is dishonest. John said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. What do you have in life that's good? Is any of it something that was not given to you by God? Well, you know, I have this education. I worked really hard. Well, who gave you a brain to be able to be educated, to be able to retain facts? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really talented and I've worked hard at, at my talent and developing my skill. Who gave you a body that could learn motor skills and learn these skills? And Well, you know, I'm just a really popular person. I've got a very magnetic personality. And Well, who gave you that personality? Anything that you and I have only came from God. And we can, we can cultivate and use the things that we've been given and see development. But even that, even the ability to develop came from God. So whether it's the thing that you're developing or the development of that thing, everything was given to us by God. And John made it very clear, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Anything good that we have was uh, is, is a gift from God. And I think about John. What was he going to boast about? Was he going to boast about his birth to elderly parents who were past the years of childbearing? Turn to John, or Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Was John going to boast about his birth? The obvious answer is no. But John had a lot of blessings that if people, if he was inclined to boast, as sinners do boast, if he was inclined to boast, he could have boasted about a lot of things. He could have said, well, you know, I, I, I really do have a, I, I am somebody that, that should be exalted because my mother conceived me when she was far past the years of childbearing. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both, and they both were now well stricken in years. We understand that there is a time in life when people are able to have children, and then they get too old, and there's no more childbearing. This is, ha this is what happened to John's parents. But he was born to them after this, and we could read on in the chapter, and, and an angel appeared to Zacharias, you're going to have a son, you're going to call his name John, God's got a great purpose for him. Was John going to boast about this? No, that was given to John. There was no way he could make that happen. He didn't have anything to boast about, yet people boast about this sort of thing. Was he going to boast about his birth? It was given to him. Look at verse 15 of Luke 1. Was he going to boast about being filled with the Holy Ghost from the womb? Luke 1, 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Christians are called upon to live in a way before God in obedience where the, the Spirit of God will fill their life. When you're saved, when you, when you repent of your sins and you call on the name of the Lord in faith, you are saved. God saves you. He makes you his child. And the Holy Spirit comes to indwell your life. It's a wonderful truth to have the Holy Spirit of God with you. No matter where you are, wherever you go, the Spirit of God is with you. But when the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit in, in the New Testament, it's talking about being empowered and being led and being used actively. It's not just being indwelled, but it's, it's being guided and, and, and sort of like a puppet being directed. Um, and, and our choices, our thinking is all being guided by the Spirit of God. Here it says, John the Baptist shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. I don't really understand that very well because John was a sinner and he had to be saved too. How could he be filled from the womb and still be a sinner that needed to be saved? I don't have an explanation for that. But was John going to boast about that? What, what control did he have over that, being filled in the mother's womb? He, he had no control over it. Was he going to boast? Of course not. He received it from heaven. Everything that he, he had, it was given to him from heaven. Was he going to boast about God's calling on his life? Look at verse 17, Luke 1, 17. 
And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Bef- go before Christ, go before God, the, 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 the Messiah. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God called him to do this. Was John going to boast that God had placed this calling on his life? No, it was given to him. It was, it was uh, initiated by the Lord. There was no room for boasting. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he asks some very good questions. He says, for who maketh thee to differ from one from another? My wife and I were talking about genetics on the way to church this morning and how DNA, people, we don't control how we're built and how tall we become and these sorts of things, that our, our hair color, all these things that, that we're born with. It was, it was given to us. And who maketh thee? to differ from one another. Why did God make some people tall and some people short and some people dark and some people... We don't... It was just given to us. And Paul goes on, And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? We've already talked about that. Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? We would understand it'd be a little ridiculous if two- and three-year-olds went around boasting about their clothing and about their toys, it was all given to them. What do, what do they have to boast about? They should just be thankful that it was given to them. And yet adults can be just as childish by boasting about what we have in this life. It was all given to us. We're being dishonest. We're exalting ourself. Self-exaltation is dishonest. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, you and I can mess things up. We can ruin things. You can ruin your health. You can jump off a bridge. You can go kill somebody. You can, you can dive headfirst into perversion and all kinds of wickedness. You can do that. And God didn't do that to you. But we don't boast about those sorts of things. We boast about the good things. But the good things all come from God. When we exalt and lift up ourselves, we're being dishonest. John was not dishonest. Self-exaltation is not only dishonest, it's illogical. Because they came to John in John chapter 3 and they said, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And I just imagine John kind of scratching his head, at least internally, and saying, why is this a problem for you? I just told, you know that I bore witness. You know that I said a greater one than me is coming. I'm before him. He's coming after me. I'm not worthy to unloose it, to to tie his shoes, to, to untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to do any of that. So why should this be a problem? It's illogical. He said in verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I'm sent before him. Why should I be upset about this? So the Christ that I'm here to glorify is doing glorious things? Why would I be upset about that? But when we lift ourselves up as though we are praiseworthy, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. It's dishonest and it's illogical. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. I want us to see the, the... Lack of logic here. Un- unfortunately and sadly, sinners do not act logically. We act very illogically. And so we do foolish things. And I want us to see ourselves in this. And I say ourselves because I'm guilty of the same kinds of things. But do you exalt yourself? Are you doing that even today, perhaps? It's dishonest and it's illogical. And we ought not do it. Second Chronicles chapter 26, we read about a, a king named Uzziah. Verse 3, we're going to pick up. It says, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord... God made him to prosper. 
That's exactly what we've been talking about. He received it from heaven. God gave him prosperity. And this is what God will do for us. But it came from God. Look at verse 15. In the, in the verses preceding, there are many things that Uzziah did and a lot of success that he enjoyed, but God made him to prosper. Look at verse 15. He, and he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong came from heaven God made him to prosper but look at verse 16 but when he was strong his heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense Uzziah sought the Lord God helped him God made him to prosper and then he began to exalt himself it's dishonest. Look what I have done. Look what I'm doing. It's illogical, as though he did it and not God, and it destroyed him. And that's what we find, thirdly, self-exaltation will destroy you. You want to destroy yourself? Just lift yourself up in pride. Just pat yourself on the back. Just say that you're wonderful, and you're, you're great, you're enviable, you're powerful, you're successful, and look what you've done for yourself. You'll destroy yourself. John said in, in John chapter 3, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. This word must is to be obliged, to be necessitated. He's not just saying he is worthy of increasing. Christ is worthy of being increased, and I'm worthy of being decreased. No, he said it must happen. He must be increased. He must be exalted. He must be praised. He must be worthy of that and, and lift it up. I must go lower. I must be decreased. I must go down. That is right. It is, it is necessary. It is of necessity for me to be lowered and abased. That's where I belong. This is how you handle problems. Put yourself in your place. You lift yourself up, it's dishonest. You lift yourself up, it's illogical. You lift yourself up, you're going to destroy yourself. This is not how you handle problems. Another king that lifted himself up is Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 5, verse 18, and, he, and one, of the, one of the ancient wonders of the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon, they, they talk about. Babylon was an incredibly successful and, and, and rich and wealthy kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar took the credit for it. Daniel 5, 18, it says, and O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father. David, or Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar's son and he's re relating the past. He's recounting the past. He says, The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Again, it came from God. It was given to him. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he, whom he would... He slew, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. All of this was in his hand. He had all this power, but God gave it to him. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him, and he was driven from the sons of men. If you and I have this kind of power, how can people take it away from us? If Nebuchadnezzar was everything that he thought he was, how could people take it away from him? But it's because it, he wasn't all of that. He was exalting himself, and it was dishonest and illogical, and it destroyed him. He was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. And we read in Daniel, his mind, he lost his mind. He thought he was a cow. He ate grass. He thought it was an animal. God took away his understanding till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointeth, it, appointeth over it whomsoever he will. Self-exaltation will destroy you. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. You want to make your problems worse? Just lift yourself up in pride. Well, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have any problem. They're to blame. If it weren't for them, I would have... No, that's lifting yourself up. 
I had a good thing going here and they ruined it. Look what I've done. That's boasting. That's lifting yourself up. It's illogical. It's dishonest. It'll destroy you. Pride goeth before destruction. John said, he must increase. I must decrease. What if you go to the doctor and you have a checkup and they come to you and they say, you've got cancer. You must have cancer surgery. We think about must pretty importantly, don't we? Okay, well, if, if, if we don't have this, I'm going to die. I must have this surgery. Do we think about humility that way? I must decrease. Because if I don't, where will I end up? Where does pride take us? Where does self-exaltation take us? If you don't put yourself in your place and you instead lift yourself up, where's the end of that? What's the end of that road? Well, we get a picture of it in Isaiah 14. Chapter, verse 13, it's quoting a creature named Lucifer. And he says, speak, speaking to Lucifer, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, this is what he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Well, we know him now as Satan. He was cast down. And he is headed for ultimate destruction. The, the, mo the epitome of destruction. The worst kind of destruction. Because every good thing that he had also came from God. But he exalted himself. He didn't put himself in his place. You want to handle problems properly? Put yourself in your place. Exalt God and abase yourself. Secondly, and I just got ahead of myself a little bit. If you want to, put your, if you want to handle problems prop, properly, put yourself in your place. Secondly, put God in his place. John chapter 3, verse 31. John the Baptist does this. John 3, 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He's speaking of Christ. He came from heaven. He's above everything. Not only have, have I received all that I have from heaven, and I don't have any reason to boast, but he's above me. He must increase. I must decrease. He's above all. He's above you too. He's above all of us. He's above everything. He came from heaven. He's above, he's above the earth. We are earthly, and we are, we are below that. Verse 32, and, that, that, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. You receive the testimony of Christ. You receive the message of Christ. You, you, you bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, as John preached. And you are sealed. You are, you are set into the, the truth. You are sealed as a child of God. I'm thankful that when you come to Christ and you accept the message that Christ has for you and you abase yourself and you lift up Christ and you confess your, your sin and you turn to Christ in faith and repentance, that you're sealed. You're saved forever. You're made a child of God. And that's what, that's what John's talking about here. Verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, and God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Spirit of God is with Christ measureless, unbounded, infinitely. Verse 35, The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. Put God in his place. What's the alternative? What's the alternative to putting yourself in your place? Well, the alternative to that is exalting yourself. Self-exaltation. We've talked about that. What's the, different, what's the alternative to putting God in his place? Well, it's we could say it's take, pulling him down, but it's, it's unbelief because the Bible tells us who God is and what his place is. And when we do not put God in his place in our heart and acknowledge him as that, we're guilty of unbelief. We're saying, I don't believe that. That's a lie. That's false. And there's something about unbelief 
it's dishonest. Just like self-exaltation is dishonest, unbelief is dishonest. John 1, 9 says, speaking of Christ, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Sometimes we don't believe things because we've never seen any evidence for them. Um, you might say, <laughs> my boss is a jerk because all I've ever seen is evidence that he's a jerk. And that's a, that's a human example. Hopefully you don't have a boss like that. You might say, you know, I, I am not good at math because all the evidence I've ever seen is that I struggle with math. It's an evidence that, oh, no, you're really good at math. Well, I've never seen any evidence to lead me to believe that. We might disbelieve something because we've never seen any evidence, but that is not true of God. Some people say God doesn't exist. If he does exist, where is he? Where, where is the evidence? But the Bible is very clear that every man knows that God is real. And when people say that God is not real, they are deceiving themselves. They are being dishonest. The light, the Christ, the truth of God lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And we can deceive ourselves, but that's the point. Unbelief is dishonest. Look at Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They're holding it down. They're keeping it from being free. They're keeping it from having a free course in their life. Because that which may be known of God is manifest unto them. For God hath showed it unto them. He's revealed. This is what you can know about me. And they don't want to. It's been revealed. They're being dishonest. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Atheists are without excuse. Atheists try to say, no, God doesn't exist because this and this and this has happened in my life, and I tried to find God, and he didn't show himself to me, so therefore I know God doesn't exist. Well, the Bible says something very different. That which may be known of God is manifest. It's visible. It's been displayed. God hath showed it unto them. Unbelief is dishonest. When people say God doesn't exist, God isn't good, God isn't mighty, God isn't wise, they're being dishonest. They're not, being, they're, they're not operating without enough evidence. They, are, they have enough evidence and they're being dishonest. Con let's continue reading. We see that unbelief is illogical. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, calling those things, those statues, gods or God. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. There's a lot of talk in our world about AI, artificial intelligence. How many of you have read some of those things? Articles, maybe books. And, and it's really proliferating. It's multiplying. There, it seems like all of these major companies are producing their own AI engine. And that can be kind of concerning. People are, are um, speculating about where this could take us and, you know, the, the sci-fi um, fear that AI is going to take over the world and defeat humans. And, and that's where our mind goes. But I just kind of think that something that the creator is going to be greater than the creation. If men created something, what they created is not going to be greater than them because they made it. And that is true of the universe. People worship animals, the stars, whatever. All of those things are created. People worship other people. It's all created. I was talking with 
Uh, Mrs. Richards, back here, and this for our visitors as well, I mentioned in the Sunday School Hour, um, on Friday we had an a international fair and people set up tables with each table representing a different country and all kinds of souvenirs and they served some ethnic foods for the kids and it was a great time. And you're welcome to go back there and look at what their displays, they're still set up back here. But um, in Russia, she told me that, uh, I believe it's Stalin, I might be getting that wrong now, I didn't prepare to say this, um, it, his body is preserved for display. And I was astounded by that. A couple, a couple of centuries has been, well, I'm, I'm wrong on some of my facts, I know I am. But they preserved his body many, many years. Maybe it's Lenin that they have back there. Anyway, he's on display. There's his body and people worship him. She told me people look at him as a god. They worship him as a god. They're worshiping a man who is created. What did he have that he didn't get from God? Nothing. And he was a wicked man. People worship animals. People worship each other. And it's, we're worshiping the creature. What about the creator? We still haven't figured out how the human body works in all of its, in all of its intricacies and, and how DNA works in all of its ways. Why are we worshiping this? What about the, thi- the, the one that made this? Why don't we worship that? Unbelief is illogical. And God, people are determined. They refuse to believe in God. And so they worship something else. It's illogical. And finally, unbelief will destroy you. Romans 1.26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, Who wants to live like that? But this is what happens when people say, I will not believe in God. And they refuse and their heart is hard and they lift themselves up and finally God says, okay, go do that. I'll let you. I'll allow you to pursue sin. We we see so much of that in our world today. People saying, I'm enlightened. I get to live this way. And the Bible says it's wicked and vile and an abomination, but I'm going to do it anyway. And those people aren't happy. They're not fulfilled. They're not content. They're very discontented, very strident in trying to make people approve of them because they have a guilty conscience. God's giving them up unto what they're pursuing. And it's destroying them. And it's sad. This is what unbelief does to us. And what we've described here sounds very similar to self-exaltation. Because pride and unbelief are two sides of the same coin. You lift yourself up in pride, it's because you don't believe what God says about you. You don't believe what God says about himself and what God says about sin. The natural result is that you're going to lift yourself up in pride. Psalm 14.3 says, They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And pride hears that and says, I'm still a good person. I'm a good person. I mean, look what I do. I mean, the Bible says there's none that doeth good, but no, I I am a good person. Pride says, I don't believe what the Bible says. I know I'm good. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And unbelief says, well, that's not accurate because I'm righteous. I mean, look what I've done. You want to know how many people I've helped? Let me tell you. It's not, it's not exactly true that there is none that doeth good, because I do good. That's what pride says. And if that's you, if you refuse 
to believe what God has said. If you lift yourself up, there is destruction coming. It will destroy you. Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. There are some really horrendous sins in there. Like murderers, murder is a terrible sin. Whoremongers, terrible immorality. Sorcerers, idolaters, these are, these are wicked people. But liars, well, I mean, that's not so bad. I mean, I, I lied to protect somebody. I lied to, yeah, it's not that bad. Well, it is that bad. That's what God says. Unbelieving, I mean, if I had more evidence, no, it's wicked. Fearful, it's because we don't believe. All of these people shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, because there is none that doeth good. No, not one. And if you are still lost, my friend, you do not do good. Everything that you do is stained with your sin. It's not a pretty picture. It's not a complimentary thing. But you will not handle problems well if you do not put yourself in your place and put God in his place. Problems will not, will not turn out well. You will not respond properly. It will just make things worse. You must put yourself in your place. You must put God in his place. And thirdly, you must trust in God. Do you have a problem today? Yeah, you know, my car wouldn't start. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, you know, the doctor just found cancer. That's a problem. Yeah, you know, my, my relative, you know, we're not speaking, or I'm having trouble with my spouse, or, you know, I lost my job. Yeah, those are problems. Um, I realize I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved. That is a problem. You know, I haven't been walking with the Lord like I should. I've been, I've been running from the Lord. I haven't been reading my Bible. That's a problem. So how do you respond to those problems? How do you handle those problems? Put yourself in your place. Don't lift yourself up in pride. Don't defend yourself. Don't, don't, don't try to cover up for your sin and justify yourself. Put yourself in your place. Secondly, put God in His place. And thirdly, trust in God. Trust in what He's said. Trust in what He's commanded. If you are in your place and you've put God in His place in your heart and mind, and I make that clear, in your heart, in your life, because God is in His place, and we can't take Him down from His true place. He's God. It doesn't matter what people say about Him. He's still God. He's still in control. He's still mighty. He's still omnipotent. But in your heart, in your mind, you need to put Him in His rightful place. If you're in your place, and you've put God in His place, there's only one thing left to do, which is just to trust Him and to believe what He said. It's a natural result. And in John chapter 3, verse 36, we see that. John responded to this problem. The Jews came to him and said, uh, Rabbi, somebody else is baptizing. What are you going to do about that? I mean, this is a problem. No, anything that I have came from God. Why are you acting like I should be feeling threatened about this? I'm not going to exalt myself. I'm going to humble myself. Everything I have came from the Lord. But, and he is above all. He's God. I'm not going to lift myself up close to him or near him or over him so what do we do instead what do we what do we believe well john 3 36 he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abideth on him and he it was he was saying to his his the the jews here that were talking to him there's something you don't understand why are you coming to me as though this is a problem you don't understand my place you don't understand your place you're not in your place you don't think i'm in my place i need to humble myself god's not in his place you need to lift him up and just trust what he has to say trust what he's preaching have you listened to him preach are you coming to him in repentance are you being baptized lift him up believe on christ whosoever he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life do you want everlasting life i sure do believe him believe what he said it's very simple doesn't mean people do it he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life it doesn't say he that believeth on the son and is a decent person he that believeth on the son and goes to church regularly he that believeth on the son and cleans up their life he that believeth on the son 
and is really nice to people. None of that is part of it. You have to trust in God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. There isn't another way. Salvation comes by believing on the Son. So, purely trusting in God. And there's no other way. That's it. John is giving an A or B decision. Believe on the Son or not believe on the Son. Have everlasting life or not have everlasting life. I'm thankful that God makes things very simple for us that way. You go out in the world, you find hundreds of different religions. They all have a slightly different presentation. Which one's true? And people end up saying, well, I like that little piece, and I like that detail, and I like that part, and I'll kind of just pick what I like and kind of come up with my own religion, and now I'm joining the crowd. You know, I've got my version too, and you have, and that's nice for you, this is right for me. God doesn't expect us to do that and to, to arrive at the truth. It's very simple. A or B. Believe on the Son or not. That's our choice. Believe what God has said or don't. Have everlasting life or don't. That's it. That's our choice. But we're not going to do that if we aren't in our place, if we haven't humbled ourselves. We're not going to do that if we haven't put God in his place by lifting him up above all. And this A or B choice is not only for lost people. 1 John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm writing to you who have believed. You are saved. You're, you have everlasting life and you're going to heaven. I'm writing to you. I know, I know my audience. And here's why I've written to you. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. It is a sad truth that Christians can doubt their salvation. Am I really saved? I don't know. I'm confused. It's possible for us to do that. And John wrote his epistle so that we don't have to doubt. We can know for sure. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, if you believed on the name of the Son of God and you have eternal life, isn't that settled? Well, sadly, no, because we still have sin in our heart. We still have a, a wicked flesh, and we still can stop trusting and believing on the name of the Son of God. Not, it doesn't make us lost. It doesn't take away our eternal life. We still have that, but it, doesn't, it does mean that we don't live like we're saved. It does mean that we don't live in faith. We don't act in faith. We can still lift ourselves up. You can be saved and exalt yourself. You can be saved and refuse to believe in God, and it changes how you live. It doesn't make you anyone, anything but a child of God. You're still a child of God. Once saved, you're always saved. But, but saved people can make the same wicked choices that lost people can make. In Luke chapter 18, we read about a Pharisee who went to the temple to pray. And all he did was lift himself up. He knew the truth. He was an expert in the law. And he said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust. I am a really good person. I'm not, I'm not like this publican. Lifting himself up. It was the publican who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Trust in God. What has God said? Do you believe it? What do your choices reflect? Well, you know, if, if I... If, I, I do believe God, but he's not holding up his end of the bargain. That's not possible. If you believe that, you're believing a lie. God always holds up his side, his end of the bargain. He's, he's God. He always, comes, he always comes through. We see the spirit of, of trust and belief in Psalm 18, verse 1. The psalmist says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. 
There's some real trust. So many terms that speak of safety and protection. You don't run to something that you don't think can protect you. You don't lock your door if you don't think the door will be a deterrent to an intruder. We hide behind things that provide us protection. And this psalmist is saying, the Lord is that. I trust him. Turn to Luke chapter 5. And as we finished here, as we finish here, I want to ask some questions. Do you have trouble trusting God? Do you have that trouble because you're proud? Could that be the reason? Luke chapter 5, verse 1, we see Jesus teaching the word of God. And there were two ships, and he entered into one of them in verse 3. Uh, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So many people there to hear. There wasn't room on the shore. He got in the boat and taught from the boat. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. We're the fish. We're professionals here. We didn't catch anything. I don't think it's going to work. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse 9. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. They were astonished. Why? Because they didn't believe. And to be fair, I probably wouldn't have either in their, in their situation. He wasn't expecting that. He was astonished. And he was humbled. And he said, you know what? Depart from me. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I was lifting myself up in pride. I thought I knew. And I thought that you had no idea. You're, you're not a fisherman, Jesus. You grew up as a carpenter. Leave the fishing to us. That was probably his attitude. And he was humbled because Christ is God. Do you have trouble trusting God? Is it because you're proud? Or is it maybe because you're unbelieving? Look at Mark chapter 9. It is a common human problem to struggle to trust God. It is routine for us. It's normal. It's not right. But it is quite normal, quite common. We struggle to trust God. Is it because we're unbelieving? Mark 9, 14, we see Jesus approaching a crowd. And they, he came to his disciples. There was a great multitude. They came running to him. Verse 16, he's asking, why are you questioning? Verse 17, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. He's, he's possessed with the spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. And he foameth. Foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him and said, saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring him unto me. They brought him, and he fell foaming. The boy was, was, was being afflicted here. Verse 21, how long has this happened? He says, of a child. Oft times it hath cast him into the fire, verse 22, and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, please help. Verse 23, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. No, the if isn't on my side. The if isn't about me. The if is about you. Will you believe? If you believe. Don't say if I can do anything. I can do all things is his point. The if is not on my side. The if is on your side. Will you believe? Well, you know, I, I, I just have trouble trusting God. Is it because you're proud? Is it because you are unbelieving? Such a wonderful response that speaks to my heart in verse 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I'm struggling, Lord. I want to believe. And I do believe. But I feel like I still have unbelief. But he believed. It was enough. 
And in verse 25, Jesus rebuked the foul spirit. Verse 26, and the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. And that father got his son back whole and normal and restored. Do you have trouble trusting God? Is it because you exalt yourself? You don't put yourself in your place? Or is it because you don't put God in his place? Maybe it's because you think it's too late. Look at Mark chapter 5. Mark 5.35. 5, Sometimes people don't trust God because they think it's too late. It's, it's over. It's, it's done. The opportunity is past. Verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? The father came to ask for his daughter to be raised from the dead. And then people said, the daughter is dead. It's over with. It's too late. Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, it's not too late. It's not too late with God. Don't think it's too late. Put yourself in your place. Put God in his place and trust God. Later in the chapter that he walked in and they were mourning the death of the girl and he said she's just asleep and they laughed him to scorn. But they weren't laughing when he brought her out alive. It's not too late. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. We have many problems that come at us in our life. And we must handle them properly. We must get in our place. Don't exalt yourself. We must put God in his place. Lift him up high above all. And then we must trust in God. Your place, my place, is abased. That's where we belong. God's place is high and lifted up above all. And if, real, if that's where we all are, it is natural. It's normal. It's expected to just trust in God because he's up there and I'm down here. I can't do anything, but he can. So why wouldn't I trust him? Yet people struggle because they're not in their place or God's not in his place. This is how we handle problems. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John handled this problem very well. And we can do the same. If we believe God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Help us to trust you. There is no problem too hard for God. There is no problem in which God cannot receive glory. He is Lord over all. He is not limited. And so help us to get in our place, to put you in your place in our hearts, and just to trust you. Too often we try to make things happen. We try to salve our conscience. We try to fix the issue. We try to uh, deny that the problem even exists. And all we do is make it worse. All we do is ruin our own joy and, and, and make ourselves fearful. Help us just to be in our place, to abase ourselves, to lift up Christ, and to trust him. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with me, we'll have a brief moment of invitation, we call it. God's spoken to you, shown you that maybe you haven't put yourself in your place, or maybe you haven't put God in his place. Maybe you're not trusting him, and you want to come up to the front and pray and respond to the Lord. You're welcome to do that. Maybe you want, you have some questions you'd like to ask 
someone and have someone open the Bible and, and give you a Bible answer, we'd love to do that for you. Just come to the front. We won't embarrass you. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to what the Spirit of God might be saying to you. Don't ignore him. Don't push him away. He's still working. You still have an opportunity. It's not too late. Get in your place. Put him in his place and just trust what he said. It's very simple. But it's often difficult. It doesn't have to be. Let's just obey. Let's just do it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, he can have it. Because he's God and I am not. Will you surrender all to the Lord? He's worthy of it. Thank you for your attention this morning. It's great to have you here. And if we can be a blessing to you, if we can give you Bible answers to your questions, we want to do that. But don't ignore what God might be speaking to you about. That is the worst choice that you and I could ever make, is pushing God away and ignoring and, and rejecting what he has to say. Respond to him. Come to him. Trust in him. Abase yourself. Where, I, where we belong is down low. Stay low. And the Lord will bless. Trust in the Lord with what he's said. Trust in his words. He'll change your life and he'll help you handle all of your problems properly. doesn't mean you won't have any problems, but you can handle them right and he'll be glorified instead of us being destroyed. Respond properly. And if so, if we can answer any of those questions, we'd love to do it. Let us know. We're going to be back here tonight at 6 o'clock, opening the word of God again. Hope that you can be with us. But we're thankful that you're here. We're honored by your presence. Thank you for coming and hope you have a good afternoon. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God and we thank you for the example of John the Baptist here showing us how to handle problems and how to put ourselves and put God in, in the rightful place that we each deserve. I pray that you would help us to live this way. Help us not to be proud. It's dishonest and illogical. Help us not to be unbelievers. It'll destroy us. But instead, help us just to trust in what God said. Just follow and obey. Do it cheerfully because God is good. And he will always accomplish his good will when we'll just follow him. Pray that you'd work in hearts. Bring us back safely tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.